Chapter 4 In this annihilation, every longing, hunger, and thirst is dissolved, perfected, healed, and made forever irrelevant. Question, answer. A voice comes to your soul, saying, lift your foot, cross over, move into the emptiness of question, and answer and question. Rumi. Keep asking those deep questions, sleep on, when you wake even you'll be gone. Ik Q. You must continue to ask questions, pursuing each question as it arises, with great earnestness. Any question that may arise is here answered immediately, and they all have the same answer. And that is, that that question, that thought, like all thoughts, is empty. When there is the misconception, the idea that there is a separate entity here out of whose individual mind the thought or question arises, then questions are taken as important. When all is seen as it is, all thoughts, feelings, and actions are seen to arise as the infinite expression of consciousness. Consciousness, however it appears to the apparent individual. These body-mind things are only instruments, objects in consciousness, and therefore cannot possibly know the basis, the purpose, the reason by which consciousness works. When any question is asked in this context, the question dissolves. All simply is as it is. Well, there you are, so that's good. How long has it been since you awakened to this? Here we go again. You should know better since who awakened. What you call this body-mind thing, the apparent individual. You miss my point. There is no one here. The body-mind is an object only. The individual is only apparent, a character in the dream. It cannot be the character in a dream who awakens. So it is the dreamer who awakens? The idea of awakening is only an analogy. Be careful not to begin taking it literally. Any analogy breaks down eventually, and this one does here. The dreamer is consciousness, which is all that is. It has never been asleep, has no need to awaken. So who awakens? The analogy of awakening, like any analogy, can have a certain limited usefulness. It is one of the straws grasped at in an attempt to describe the indescribable, to communicate what cannot be communicated. It also has its drawbacks. In particular, it can be used to make a demarcation, a distinction, a false separation between those perceived individuals who have awakened and those perceived individuals who have not. This is artificial, a construct of the mind. There is only consciousness, streaming through and expressing as all these body-mind things. What happens in one body-mind thing as distinct from another is insignificant, unless you believe they exist as individual persons and you identify as one of them. As the third Zen patriarch wrote, Distinctions arise from the clinging needs of the ignorant. What benefit can be derived from attachment to distinctions and separations? Surely there is a difference between one who is awakened and one who is not. Not at all, as Wang Po said. There is just a mysterious, tacit understanding and no more. The difference, then, is that some of us have this understanding while most do not. You are taking it personally, setting up us and them, which makes nonsense of it. These are the distinctions that the Zen patriarch was talking about. Please understand what you are referring to as us or as them, our personal reference points which are seen here to be illusory, purely mythical in spite of being taken quite seriously by you and just about everyone else. There is understanding, 
There is no one here to have understanding, or to have anything for that matter. But you yourself use words like you and everyone. If you went to a foreign country, you'll find it hard to communicate unless you learned and used the language that the locals used. Our language is structured in a way that makes it all but impossible to speak without using personal pronouns and other words which seem to refer to individuals. This makes things difficult, but language must still be used. Trying to avoid these words altogether just results in stilted and awkward speech which calls attention to itself and fails to communicate. So one must continue to use the conventions of language, which include personal pronouns to refer to an experience and an understanding which is completely impersonal. It's a little like continuing to talk about sunrise and sunset, even when you know quite well that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, and so it doesn't rise or set, but only appears to because of the earth's own rotation. When I use the terms I or me, they refer to nothing personal at all, since it's completely obvious from this perspective that there is no person here. There is only all that is, streaming through all these apparent forms. On the other hand, when you say something like, some of us have the understanding, but most do not, it's evident that you are taking the distinction between yourself as an individual and others as individuals quite seriously, and are busy comparing and judging between them. To return to your earlier comment, earnestly asking questions should not be seen as an end in itself. Asking questions does not actually lead anywhere. In the tradition of Jnana Yoga, asking questions operates a bit like the Zen Kone, gradually backing the mind into a corner or exhausting it to the point that it realizes that while questions can go on forever, truth will never be found there. The third Zen patriarch again, to seek mind with the discriminating mind, is the greatest of mistakes. The problem, you see, is that all questions arise out of their answers. You can't ask a question about self, or truth, or the understanding, that you don't already on some level know the answer to. If you didn't know the answer, the question never could have occurred to you. That's why the great Zen and Advaita masters rarely answered a question. They redirected it. The point of asking a question is not to get the answer which you already have, despite what you may believe. There's really no benefit in getting answers. All the answers in the world will not lead to understanding. All answers are within the dream, as are all questions. What you want is no answer, which can only be arrived at by no question. For each body-mind, there is only one no question, what I sometimes call the dangerous question, the asking of which contains the end to all questions, the asking of which stops you, annihilates you. If a question arises, then by all means, ask it. Sometimes it is all that can happen. But there is nothing sacred about asking questions. It is when the questions cease and the mind is empty that there is an opening. When you say there's nobody home, what do you mean? Who isn't home? It is the sense of being a separate self, an individual, a separate, autonomous, independent entity. So the separate self is no longer home. Yes, although I tend to say the sense of being a separate self is what is no longer there, because the separate self as such has never existed, was never there, was only an idea and a mistaken one. The ego? I tend to equate the ego with the sense of a separate self, yes. Others may mean different things by the ego. But some teachers say the ego is still there, but transformed or made harmless. 
You're referring to Ramana Maharshi's analogy of the burnt rope. He said the ego of the sage is like a burnt rope. It is harmless in that it cannot any longer be used to hold anyone in the bondage of samsara. Some teachers take this and say that although the rope is burnt, it is still there. But in fact, it is not still there as a rope. The ego is not still there as an ego, as a sense of separate self. What is still there is the appearance, various forms of functioning in the body-mind instrument. But this functioning does not add up to a separate entity. It never did. Have you ever actually experienced a burnt rope? This is another one of those agricultural parables that might be a little hard to understand in the modern world. The burnt rope phenomenon is quite an extraordinary thing. When I was twelve, the tool shed on the farm burned, and as I was picking through the charred remains with my father to salvage tools and hardware, I came across what appeared to be the big coil of manila rope that we used on the farm for jobs like felling trees. I was surprised that it had survived the fire, but when my hand tried to close on it, the fingers passed through the fine, powdery ash with no resistance. There's something about natural manila or sisal rope that causes it to burn thoroughly, but for the ashes to remain in place and retain the appearance of the whole rope. This is the meaning of the Maharshi's image. What remains is not a rope, the ego at all, but only looks like one. There is only the appearance of a rope, not a rope itself. But like all analogies, this one too only goes so far. Unlike the rope that burns and is then only an appearance of a rope made of ash, the ego never really existed in the first place. It was only a mistaken idea. So then this is where that other traditional analogy takes over the image of the coil of rope that was mistaken for a snake. At first, the response is fear. Then, when it is realized that it is only a coil of rope and not a snake at all, the experience is quite different. But what has changed? Nothing. Because there was never a snake there. It was only a mistaken idea. The separate self, the ego, was never there. Only the idea, the sense of being an individual which turns out to be misled. And yet even that's not the point. Finally, even that falls away. Even the appearance never was. Always, everywhere, there is only the changeless self. This at least is what is understood here. This is what is meant when the understanding or awakening is called a shift in perception. Wei Wu Wei said it well. Merely a readjustment is needed, such readjustment being the abandoning of identification with an inexistent individual self. But I heard Wei Wu Wei wasn't enlightened. And he had Alzheimer's at the end, so he wasn't enlightened. Whoa, one thing at a time here. First, whether or not Terence Gray was awakened is a moot question. As I read his books, it seems there are at least a couple of places where he says himself that he is not. This need to label someone enlightened or unenlightened is misplaced. It is based on a belief in the separate self. If there are no separate individual selves, who's awakened? All there is is presence. Separating and making distinctions and comparing is the illusion. Whether the one we know as Wei Wu Wei was enlightened or not, his works are among the clearest and most uncompromisingly accurate renditions of the teaching you can find. The complete understanding and the ability to express it accurately doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. Some of the truly deeply awakened can express it at all, while some of the best expressions come from those who have an excellent intuitive grasp of the meaning of the teaching on an intellectual level. 
even though it may not have gone deep enough that they no longer experience any separate self. Now, this Alzheimer's thing needs to be laid to rest. This is part of the misconception that with awakening, the sage becomes an elevated or perfect human being. Alzheimer's is a physical disease affecting the organism. It results from genetic and environmental factors, and so in our terminology, it is a matter of the programming and conditioning of that body-mind organism. As such, it is no different than any other disease, no different from Ramana Maharshi's or Nisargadatta Maharaja's cancer. Since it affects the physical cells of the brain, the results are not very pretty but it's still a disease of the organism and arises as part of the organic functioning of that body-mind. The so-called sage knows that whatever arises is the perfect unfolding of totality and consciousness, and in which dream character what event happens is irrelevant. The body-mind organism of the sage has no special immunity conferred upon it at awakening. The understanding is not a vaccine against Alzheimer's or anything else. But someone who has Alzheimer's isn't going to be making much sense a lot of the time. It sure isn't going to look very pretty. It'll be quite disturbing to those who need perfect, enlightened beings to look up to or have fantasies of disease-free, enlightened living or have absorbed some New Age ideas about causing your own sickness. But if the awakening has truly occurred, and there was no longer any sense of a separate self, and then the body-mind organism succumbs to an organic disease, you can't go back and retroactively say that the awakening didn't happen after all. It did. Then the disease happened. Life is like that. It's messy. It includes everything. Seems like that introduces a lot of confusion, or potential confusion. Confusion is already there. What's wrong with confusion? Again, it's part of the overall functioning. In duality, you can't have light without dark, up without down, biddy without ugliness, clarity without confusion. Declaring war on confusion and trying to eliminate it completely is misguided. Remember what Maharaj said to someone who wanted out of the dream. The dream is not your problem. Your problem is that you like one part of the dream and not another. Trying to eliminate the parts of the dream you don't like will keep you occupied, but it will also keep you frustrated. It can never succeed because the manifestation is inherently dualistic. Awakening is seeing what is and acceptance of the whole, the whole messy lot. You don't necessarily have to like it, but it's what is. I don't understand. Just because there's confusion doesn't mean I still shouldn't try to be as clear as I can. Then, be clear as you can. If you have been given that kind of motivation, you may be instrumental in contributing to the overall balance. But be aware that despite your best efforts, it's always possible that the things you say or do may have unintended consequences. In spite of trying to be clear, it may be that what you say will still be confusing to some people and may actually add to the overall confusion, even though that wasn't your intent. The point is that it's not up to you. All of this the overall balance is being taken care of in ways that are not up to the body-mind mechanisms and which they cannot begin to comprehend, with the level of cognition allotted to them. Knowing this, there is no intent here, just a consent to, a cooperation with, whatever arises. And sure, whatever arises may include a motivation to be clear, just don't be surprised that if that is not the outcome, because the outcome is not up to you, and the ultimate outcome in the long term will be to maintain the balance of clarity and confusion in the totality. Perspective We dance round in a ring and suppose 
while the secret sits in the middle and knows. Robert Frost When we understand, we are at the center of the circle, and there we sit while yes and no chase each other around the circumference. Chang Zhu In a sense, it is all a matter of perception, a perspective. The ultimate understanding spoken of in the perennial wisdom can be seen as a massive and total shift or alteration in perspective. But just how massive or total is hard to imagine until it occurs. When I was in high school in the late 60s and early 70s, Edwin Abbott's Flatland became popular among students. The small book was originally written in 1884 but it found new interest in several reprintings as it resonated with the counterculture and mood of the Nixon years. Flatland is a two-dimensional universe inhabited by two-dimensional beings who know only width and length, each as the stick figures you might draw on paper. Existing on the flat plane of the paper, they know nothing of height or depth, which do not exist in their world. Consequently, they have never thought of these unreal directions or dimensions and have no words for them. Our words height or depth, above and below, as well as the ideas or concepts which these words represent to us, do not exist in their world. The book narrates the experiences of one of such two-dimensional being, a square, when his comfortable two-dimensional life is invaded one day, by an incomprehensible creature from another dimension, a sphere. Only gradually was the square able to comprehend the initially disoriented experience of a third dimension. Needless to say, the great difficulty arose when the square tried to express his experience to other two-dimensional figures like himself. How does one describe above, in a context where there exist only forward, back, and two directions of sideways. The square tried using existing words, forward but not forward, a different forward, and tried using new words he had learned from the sphere, but above was only nonsense syllables to the flatlanders. So the square who knew he had had real experiences of this third dimension found himself being regarded as an idiot talking nonsense. The experience of the Flatland Square will be familiar to anyone who has had a spiritual or mystical experience of otherness, of another dimension beyond our familiar physical three dimensions, and then tried to express this to others in comprehensible language. And it can be useful as a metaphor to illustrate or express how the understanding cannot be described in any terms or concepts available here. But the shift in perspective inherent in the understanding is even more total than the inclusion of another dimension. Rather than the mere addition of a dimension, it is a shift out of all dimensions in that it is not a question of seeing differently or seeing new or different things, but of the disappearance of the one who sees. In a sense, the understanding is the opposite of the discovery of the third dimension by the two-dimensional flatlander. In the common shared experience of this world of duality and process, what is experienced is always the triad of the experiencer, what is experienced, and the experience itself. There appears to be the doer of an action, the thing acted upon and the action. The one who thinks, that which is thought of, and the thought. The seer, that which is seen, and sight. And so on. Even the one who is, what one is, and the being of that. But in the unity consciousness of the understanding, these perceived discrete dimensions of otherness collapse into oneness. And in place of the split mind perception of experiencer, the experienced, and the experience. There is, in whole mind, only experiencing. No doer, no object, 
No thing done. Only functioning. Only seeing. Only being. Not in the sense of a being, but rather being. All there is is not someone conscious of some thing, but rather simply impersonal consciousness. Consciousness is all there is, and consciousness is the functioning, the seeing, the being, the experiencing, which is perceived by split mind as someone doing or being something. How does this shift occur? How does one go from perceiving with split mind to the understanding of whole mind? Well, the point is that one doesn't. No one ever understands in this sense. There is only understanding, and the understanding is that there is no one to understand and no thing to be understood. The very essence of the understanding is that while events seem to be happening, and deeds appear to be done, no one does it, nor is anything done. It is pure doing. Wei Wu Wei. There is no individual to do or understand anything. There is no thing to be done or understood. Appearances notwithstanding, there are no discrete individuals or entities of any kind anywhere. This seeking, this quest for understanding, ultimately leads to the annihilation of the seeker, to the realization that there never was a seeker to begin with that the entire world perceived by split mind, including the perceiver, is an elaborate illusion. Wei Wu Wei. It is important to understand that there is nothing to acquire, but only an air to be exposed, because acquiring necessarily involves using, and so strengthening the spurious eye whose dissolution we require. For this merely a readjustment is needed, such readjustment being the abandonment of identification with an inexistent individual self, an abandonment which leaves us unblindfolded and awake in our eternal nature. To seek to persuade ourselves that we do not exist as individual entities is, however, to ask the eye to believe that what it is looking at is not there. But it is not we alone who have no existence as entities. There are not any anywhere in the reality of the cosmos. Never have been, and never could be. Only whole mind can reveal this knowledge as direct cognition, which, once realized, is obvious. This is the total adjustment and only I remains. It's not new or even unusual to think of all this world and life as an illusion or a dream. The analogy is all around us. From Shakespeare, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. To nursery rhymes, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. What hardly anyone realizes is that the one who might think he understands this is himself, a dream character, part of the illusion. That the mind which thinks life is but a dream does not itself have an existence apart from the dream. That this thought arises only within and as part of the dream. Naturally, this is enough to put off most of the human race. Does it exist cannot be expressed. Two examples. Get in an airplane in Oklahoma. Fly straight south. What do you fly over? If you answer Texas, I have news for you. There is no such thing as Texas. If you look down while flying south, you will not see any such thing as Texas. You will see what is there. Arid desert, farmland, mountains, rivers, roads, cities. Texas is only an idea. It exists only as an agreed-upon conceptual construct. There is nothing real about the border between Texas and Oklahoma, and you will not see it if you fly over it. The delineation, the distinction, 
The decision to call this bit of land Texas and a few feet over here to call it Oklahoma exists only in the mind as a thought construct. The separation into discrete separate entities is a layer added in thought only. This distinction, this naming, this separation, these things as separate entities, do not exist except as ideas. You and me are Texas. Next time you go to a movie, stop when you leave the theater and think about what you have just seen. When you start to describe the movie, I would ask you to stop. The movie may be what you saw, but it is not what was there. You were in the movie theater for some two hours, and for almost the entire time you were staring steadily at the screen in front of the theater. Yet if I ask you to describe that screen to me, you might look at me blankly because of the beams of colored light that were projected at the screen the entire time. You did not see the screen, even though it was there and you were looking at it. There were no real people or landscapes or events there on the screen, although you probably got caught up in the story and the emotion of the movie as if it were real. That's what you go to movies for. And if you spend any time during the movie thinking, this isn't real, it probably wasn't a very good movie. The projection of light onto the screen caused the appearance of people and places and events that looked real and evoked mental and emotional responses in you. But all the time you never saw the screen, which is what you were actually staring at for two hours and without which the projected light would not have fallen on anything, and you would have not been able to see the movie either. You and me are the movie. It's all a matter of perspective, in an even simpler, more subtle way. How we perceive things, and therefore what we call real or true or right, has to do with our perspective from where we sit in the overall continuum. This is basic, but is so often completely overlooked. The tendency is to absolutize one's own perspective, to make everything relative to that, when in fact our perspective is what is relative. The entire history of humanity, including the present, is filled with every form of exploitation and subjugation and injustice and intolerance, all of it made possible by the fact that from some perspective, from some point of view, it seems justified. Clearly, the basic assumptions about the way things are are in fact very relative and dependent on perspective, on one's relative position in the overall spectrum. The understanding carries with it a massive shift in this perspective. To the dream characters, things in life matter and are important. From the latest war to the environment, to what your children are being taught in school, to the way that man just looked at you. Things and events are thought to have significance and to be important. That's what seems to make life worth living. Thinking of things as important and having value. Causes, crusades, principles, values getting involved in what you believe is right, working against what you believe is wrong, making the world a better place. But in the understanding, it is seen that all this only serves to further the illusion and perpetuate suffering. Values seen as absolute in the dream upon examination turn out to be arbitrary. The values espoused in one body mind are dependent on the programming and conditioning from a certain time and nation and culture and race and family, and are the opposite values held just as dearly in another body mind? Right, wrong, good, evil, important, unimportant, according to whom? From whose perspective? It is the way of all the earth for most people to feel that those things that are closest to them are most important. From your perspective, 
you will most likely feel more distraught over the death of one family member than you will over the death of thousands in a foreign country you have never seen. From one perspective, an act of terror is evidence of evil. From another, it is evidence that God is great. It is neither. It just is. It all simply arises in the wholeness of consciousness, which is totally impersonal and entirely neutral. Right or wrong, important or not, are only your projections from your perspective. But the perspective, as it were, of impersonal consciousness is unfathomably immense. Uncountable zillions of life forms in uncountable billions of solar systems, matter and life, and energy and forms we cannot imagine. And on scales that make all life we know, all this planet itself, all of the universe that we know or can imagine, hardly noticeable. The beauty is that, in fact, all this we know is more than noticed, is in fact nothing other than consciousness, is consciousness itself, as perceived by us as these things. But that anything we may think we are, or think we know, or believe we want, or believe to be right, is of any special importance, is simply a matter of our extremely limited perspective. Anyone who writes or talks about this subject will at one time or another be inundated with questions around this issue of importance and value, right and wrong, good and evil. How can there be evil in the world? How can there be natural disasters? How can there be wars? How can a God allow poverty or violence? How can a God or presence or consciousness allow children to suffer? All of us have experienced or been close to someone who has some form of tragedy, some form of violence or loss or misfortune or pain, some more than others. There is no escape from this. It is of the nature of this dream reality that it contains what is experienced as pleasure and pain, good stuff and bad stuff. And no one knows what the next moment will bring or what the overall mix will be for anybody mind. There is no answer, no reason, from within the dream. Suffering is a call for inquiry. All pain needs investigation. Nizargadatta Maharaj Suffering and pain raise questions like nothing else does. Inquire into it. Investigate it. The why question gets nowhere. That is only the ego mind seeking for non-existent control. It will never be satisfied and leads only to resentment and more suffering. Instead, investigate into the suffering who is it that is suffering? From whose perspective is this unacceptable? Buddha said samsara is dukkha. Taking the dream to be real is not what causes suffering. It is the suffering. The only possible solution to the question of evil and suffering is to see through the illusion. Suffering in all its forms is the greatest invitation to awaken, and it is never far away or in the immortal words of Humphrey Bogart's Rick in Casablanca, it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. Incredibly simple. Please understand that there is only one thing to be understood, and that is that you are the formless, timeless, unborn. Nizargadatta Maharaj. Here is just emptiness. There is no getting my ego out of the way and all that stuff. There is just the seeing, shining in great brilliance and clarity. Douglas Harding. Look, it's all so incredibly simple. There is no one here. This is not a figure of speech. I mean, there is truly no one here. No person, no individual speaking to you. 
You look at me and think there is a person here talking to you, trying to tell you something. I assure you, there is not. Look at me. If there were not consciousness streaming through this body, what would be there? What would this body be if consciousness were not here? A corpse, of course. Dead matter. There is nothing else here. There is only the appearance of a body and consciousness which animates it. You, along with the rest of the world, have assumed that there is a discrete individual person here. That the consciousness which is the animating force here is an individual consciousness, unique to this body and separate from the consciousness in other bodies. This is based on appearances. There appear to be separate bodies. So the assumption is that there are separate consciousnesses. The belief in this assumption blinds you to seeing what is, and is also the cause of your experience of this life as disquieting, confusing, unhappy, and generally full of fear and suffering. But it is not the case. There is in no way an individual sitting here talking to you. This body is nothing, an appearance in the dream. All there is is consciousness, and it is consciousness which is streaming through this appearance. There is nothing here that exists in and of itself. What we call the human being is not an independent being, not an originating mechanism, not a transmitter. It is a relay station of pass through mechanism for consciousness, the one consciousness all that is. That is what I am, talking to you. And it is the same one consciousness listening to this, looking back at me out of those eyes you call your own. What I am when I say I am is exactly the same as what you are when you say I am. Once seen, the irony of the situation is staggering. Look. What you think of as yourself, what you perceive as an individual person, this idea of being a separate entity, a body-mind personality, soul, intellect. This is the subsequent byproduct, an artifact, an almost accidental side effect of this streaming, this flowing of consciousness. It is the streaming of consciousness in this organism which the organism inaccurately perceives as a mind, which it thinks is its own. It is the very consciousness streaming in this organism which allows this perception at all, which makes it possible for this organism to think it is other than that same consciousness. A simple, innocent misperception. And a silly one because the very one who appears to be thinking this, who appears not to see, not to understand that it is not as a separate individual and is only as all that is, is itself the very I-ness that is the only is-ness of all seeing, of all understanding. Look into what is behind this perception. Investigate what you think of as yourself. This is the purpose. The meaning of all spirituality, of all seeking, of your very being. To understand this amazing, intricate play of consciousness by seeing what is this illusion, this mistaken perception, and what is its source which makes it possible. What you are, you always already are. It is by seeing what you are not that there is a stepping away from it stepping out of the misconceived role of a separate, fearful individual. When you step out of what you are not, what remains is not something you have to become, but what you always already are. That is why there is nothing you have to do, to become, to learn, to practice, or work at, or purify. It is completely effortless to be in your natural state. What is full of difficult, constant effort is maintaining this false and unnatural idea of being somebody, of being an individual, 
a separate something. You are a non-entity. Let it go. When it is let go of, you rest in your effortlessness of all that is, of what could be called your natural state. Effortlessness is not something that can be attained by effort. No mind is not a state that can be achieved by the mind. Peace cannot be achieved by striving. Trying to be aware of just being in the present moment is a contradiction in terms. Being self-consciously aware of it takes you out of it. Trying to be aware of I am is a similar contradiction. And for the same reason, you can't try to be happy any more than you can try to go to sleep or try to act naturally. You only act naturally when you are not trying. Not thinking but simply going about life. People would come from all over India and the whole world to see Ramana Maharshi and ask him for advice on the spiritual path. His advice? Just be yourself. This is what Nisargadatta Maharaj said of your natural state, of what you are naturally spontaneously, without effort. This state is before the appearance of beingness. It is prior to or beyond beingness and non-beingness. I am in that state which existed before the arrival of beingness and non-beingness. With the arrival of the waking state, all the world becomes manifest. Because of my beingness, my world is manifest. That also is observed by that state which is prior to beingness. And you, are that. Never interfere. To free people from the idea that they suffer is the greatest compassion. Tony Parsons Greater than the goodest good in life is to know who you are. Nizargadatta Maharaj To questions as to why he was not out helping the world or working to ease suffering or at least trying to reach more people with the teaching, Ramana Maharshi would answer, First, how do you know I am not? Your judgments are based on physical appearances only. And secondly, why do you assume that there is something that needs to be done, that the world needs helping or that people need to hear a teaching? From a certain perspective, there seem to be many ironies to this whole awakening thing. One such apparent irony has to do with why social action seems to be engaged in by so few of the truly awakened. These body-mind instruments in whom is known firsthand and without doubt the dreamlike and illusory nature of what others call the real world, to whom this world truly appears in the Buddha's words as a star at dawn, a bubble floating on a stream, a flickering lamp, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo, a rainbow, a phantom, and a dream. The Diamond Sutra. Such would seem thereby to be in a unique position to effect change, to spell evil, propagate peace and beauty, heal pain and sickness, and generally improve conditions all around. Yet it is precisely these who most often have the least inclination to do anything of the sort. There are some exceptions, of course. Rare examples, both historic and current, of awakened healers, activists, and miracle workers. The spiritual and mental technologies exist to bend and stretch the apparent laws of time and nature. But the way of the yogi, the adept, specializing in such means, and that of the jnani, the sage who surrenders into the self-annihilation of self-realization, are widely divergent if not strictly mutually exclusive paths. For the most part, the one who has fully investigated himself, the one who has come to understand, will never try to interfere with the play of consciousness. Nisargadatta Maharaj The profound awareness is that everything is perfect as it is. That is perfect. This is perfect. 
perfect comes from perfect, take perfect from perfect, and the remainder is perfect. Isha Upanishad. And by perfect, I do not mean any kind of judgment about good or bad or being better than something else. I mean it in the sense that the understanding is perfect as vast space is perfect, where nothing is lacking and nothing is in excess. Seng Tsan. To use Nizargadatta's term again, this dream you call the world is not the problem. Your problem is that you like certain parts of the dream and dislike others. Once you have seen the dream as a dream, you have done all that needs to be done. It may be helpful to let go of the idea that God has somehow screwed up and needs your help and involvement or that of the sage to set things right. What is cannot be the perfect unfolding in consciousness. And if an adjustment is needed to maintain the cosmic balance, some one, perhaps you, will be irresistibly motivated to perform an action which will serve that purpose. And that too will be perfect unfolding. Just don't take it personally. It is hardly surprising that to these body-mind instruments, with their limited perspective and from this small corner of the universe, some events may not seem very attractive. In fact, given the programming and conditioning and overall situation, many aspects of what we call life here seem extremely unpleasant, horrific, and frankly, unacceptable. The perspective of awakening is not that these do not exist, but that somehow, in a way not comprehensible to human minds, they are part of the overall balance and perfect unfolding, and are accepted as such. This is the acceptance of what is spoken of by the sages. It is not that on awakening the horrible and painful things that happen in life are found to be less horrible or painful. In fact, this awareness is often even more acute. But the whole is seen from a different perspective, which renders the issue mute. The idea that there is something wrong, that something needs to be fixed, that somebody needs to do something about this, is an integral part of the divine hypnosis of samsara. As Adyashanti so succinctly puts it, the idea that there is a problem, that's the wild hair in the ass of humanity. As with so many issues and problems, on awakening the problems and questions are not solved, they simply dissolve. With the belief in the individual entity doer, problems never cease. When the illusory nature of the individual is seen, problems never arise. Ramesh Dream Machine He who knows does not speak. He who speaks does not know. Lao Tzu Authority of any kind, especially in the field of understanding, is the most destructive thing. Leaders destroy the followers and followers destroy the leaders. J. Krishnamurti Occasionally, someone will ask point blank, Are you awakened or are you enlightened? On the surface, this seems to be a perfectly reasonable and straightforward question, deserving an equally forthright answer. I recently came across an internet website that was devoted to finding your spiritual teacher. It was all about sorting through all the teachers and gurus out there and deciding which was authentic and would be the best teacher for you. This website included a checklist of indicators and tests, one of which being that you should be able to ask a prospective teacher, are you yourself enlightened? And he or she should be able to clearly and unhesitatingly give you a direct yes or no response. If not, you should immediately go elsewhere. Any truly enlightened individual should be able to tell you so in a straightforward manner and any hedging or fudging on this question is a sign that the individual in question is a charlatan. Although this is probably well meant, the difficulty arises in that the unawakened mind of the dream character 
with its conditioning and limitations, is attempting to put itself in a position to establish the criteria whereby awakening is to be evaluated, which by definition it does not and cannot understand. It is not that anything is being evaded here. It is simply that from the point of view of awakening, the question, are you awakened, simply does not make any sense whatsoever. It is like asking, what color is a kilometer? Or as Nizar Gadatta Maharaj suggested, like asking about the child of a barren woman. The questioner is sincerely earnest, and there is a wish to answer in a way that will be helpful. But once again, the questions which are so pressing before awakening dissolve into meaninglessness and irrelevance when it happens. From the awakened perspective, the question, are you awakened, is a fundamentally mistaken question. Any answer is the wrong answer, because the premise of the question is mistaken. It is like a Zen koan, in that it is inherently unanswerable. Awakening or enlightenment is also called self-realization, because it is a matter of realizing who or what the self actually is. It is the realization of who the I is and who I is not. The very essence of awakening is the realization that there is no one here to awaken, and there is no individual or no individuals. The self is all that is. There is nothing which it is not. Consciousness is all there is. The appearance of an individual self as a separate entity and as the originator or doer of anything is the primary illusion, the basic and darkenment from which any enlightenment occurs. From the perspective of the infinite, it is obvious that the individual self absolutely does not exist. The idea that we have a self that controls, arbitrates, or is the doer behind our actions is absurd. The individual self is nothing but an idea of who we are. Ideas are ideas, and nothing more. Suzanne Siegel. Any questions about the nature or the activities of this purely mythical beast called me are therefore revealed to be nonsensical. The simple question, what are you doing, for example, can only be met with laughter or a simple shake of the head unless it is sensed that the questioner may be open to hearing the real answer. Doing? Me? There is no me to do anything nor has there ever been. Nor, if you could but see it, is there a you to do anything either, nor any things for us to be doing. Consciousness is all there is, flowing, streaming through these instruments in a manner which, in accordance with the perfect unfolding of totality, is perceived as discrete individual entities autonomously performing actions. But in truth, this is not the case. There is no individual, no entity, no separate self here to do anything or to be anything, awakened or enlightened included. There may be times in satsang or private conversation when a true niyani may find it necessary to admit that the complete understanding has occurred. Still, our well-meaning website author notwithstanding, Anyone who generally proclaims to all listeners that he or she is enlightened is highly unlikely to be, for if they were, they would understand that such a statement is inherently self-contradictory. Who? Who is enlightened, you silly goose? If you were what you say you are, you would know better. It is a little like that ubiquitous New Age slogan, We are all one. Surely well meant, but obviously self contradictory. Doesn't anyone see that if there are we, then there is not one but many? And if truly all there is is one, there cannot possibly in any way be we. Similarly, setting one's self apart as one enlightened, as an individual entity distinct from others who are not, is only to demonstrate the depth of the dream state. 
When there is understanding, there cannot possibly in any way be a me to claim it. There is a great preoccupation among spiritual seekers with this subject of awakening or enlightenment. Much thought and many conversations revolve around questions about which teacher or writer is enlightened and which is not, or whether or not a certain advanced student has gained enlightenment yet, or even how close one is oneself to awakening. All of this preoccupation, and indeed the entire subject, becomes irrelevant in the event. All there is is consciousness, functioning in and as these apparent forms. How can there be question of the apparent forms doing or gaining or becoming anything? All of this is a happening in consciousness. What happens, happens. In which apparent form, what dream, event happens, is of no significance. Who is it that cares? All this is part of the timeless secret of enlightenment. But fear not. It is, and has always been, an open secret. The truth laid open always for everyone to see. As the sage Huang Po repeated over and over, it is right in front of you. The point is that true awareness, the true understanding, cannot possibly be faked. The light of the ultimate understanding, even when it occurs in and is expressed through a mostly illiterate, uncultured body-mind organism, renders the most erudite and sophisticated intellectual comprehension of the teachings to be still just ignorant bumbling about in the dream. This has been demonstrated by sages throughout the ages, from Hui Neng in 5th century China, to Nizargadatta Maharaj in 20th century Bombay. On the other hand, there are those who may have had transformative mystical experiences of oneness and have also a commanding intellectual grasp of the teachings, together with a charismatic personality and an inclination to teach others. They will gather many followers and become quite successful in the guru business. When the blind lead the blind, none of the followers can see that the leader himself carries a white cane. But to the truly awakened, such a teacher gives himself away every time he opens his mouth. Awakening is not an experience, and it is not knowledge. Knowledge is only a veil over the known, and a highly misleading one at that. True awakening is a knowing and a seeing that goes beyond any knowledge and any experience. What is, is, and cannot be contradicted, while those still in the dream can only guess and approximate. Like so many things that have come before and many fads yet to come, Advaita and the teachings of Natunas, having existed all through human history, have recently been hungrily devoured by the American dream machine and have come out the other end in a form more palatable to the sensibilities of modern Western dream characters, but hardly recognizable to those few throughout the ages to whom this unspeakable thing has happened, for whom the pop of shift of focus, shift of perception, is so complete that there is understanding, there is knowing that there is no one there to shift, that there is no one there to know, that there is no one there to shift, to awaken. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna that from among all the people on the earth, only one in many thousands seeks me, and of those who seek, hardly one in those many thousands realizes my true nature. Taking this scriptural passage literally, and attempting to do the math to calculate how many enlightened ones there are in the world at any given time is problematic. Krishna was making a point, and I doubt it had to do with counting numbers of individuals. Nevertheless, it does give some insight into the traditional awareness as to the infrequency of the occurrence of true enlightenment. Ken Wilbur takes a shot at something similar in one taste. He relates how he once asked a Chinese Chan Zen teacher how many truly enlightened masters there had been throughout history, and the immediate answer was, maybe 1,000 altogether. 
assuming for the sake of argument as few as a billion Chinese over the same time period, 1,000 out of 1 billion comes to, yes, one millionth of a percent of the population. Again, taking the numbers literally misses the point. There is a larger sense to this regardless of the actual percentages, which has been recognized as part of the perennial wisdom. And that means, unmistakably, that the rest of the population were and are involved in, at best, various types of horizontal, translative, merely legitimate religion, magical practices, mythical beliefs, egoic petitionary prayer, ways to give meaning to the separate self. Thus, without in any way belittling the truly stunning contributions of the glorious Eastern traditions, the point is fairly straightforward. Radical transformative spirituality is extremely rare, anywhere in history and anywhere in the world. The numbers for the West are even more depressing. I rest my case. Ken Wilbur To modern Western sensibilities, this is not acceptable. It seems elitist, exclusive, politically totally incorrect. Liberation, enlightenment should be open to anyone who puts in the effort, not arbitrarily as a prize in some divine lottery system. Besides, it doesn't sell. Nobody is going to buy a ticket if the odds are one in several million. And so, in the American Dream Machine version, which, by the way, is not limited to America, enlightenment is redefined to include anyone who has had an enlightening experience. We now have awakening life in which you can call yourself awakened while still enjoying being fast asleep. And it is happening all over the place. The result is a kind of tent revivalist satsang movement. According to many of the teachers on the guru circuit, awakening is happening wherever they go, to people just like you. And it's the next great wave in the evolution of humankind to the next level of cosmic consciousness. Where have we heard this before? Everywhere. And about everything. It is the way of all the earth. The divine hypnosis. To be deceived and to stay asleep pursuing individual and collective liberation, personal and group enlightenment, when the only truth is completely impersonal and can be found only in the annihilation of the illusory individual. Everywhere and about everything, it is the way of all the earth, the divine hypnosis to be deceived and to stay asleep pursuing individual and collective liberation. If the guru says, I'm enlightened, it means the ego is enlightened, so stay away. Western teachers who say this are preachers and only write books to load more garbage on seekers and more money in their pockets. They will attract so many students, but in this Kali Yuga, the current dark age of ignorance in Hindu mythology, it is the falsehood which will draw the crowds. The truth and the true gurus will be neglected. The truth will be held by the honest and the honest will not be followed. Only the dishonest will be followed. H. W. L. Punja There are many teachers on the Tent Revival Satsang circuit talking about enlightenment as the next great step in the evolution of the human race. And it's all very exciting because that step is happening now with lots more people waking up than was ever the case at any other time in history. This kind of thing is just confused and dream-bound thinking. Enlightenment has nothing to do with turning points in history, with lots of people waking up. It has nothing to do with evolution. As Jed McKenna notes, if anything, enlightenment is evolution derailed. Evolution is a completely dualistic concept. Individuals, or the whole race, growing and changing and developing and becoming better over time, this is a description of dualism, of how dualism operates. Evolution is about change in relative objects. 
enlightenment is the opposite. It is about realizing the truth, absolute subjectivity which is unchanging. The whole concept of evolution assumes the existence of separate individual entities, a collective species or race of such entities, and their existence in something called time. It also involves a whole set of value judgments as to what condition the human race is in now and what direction it should be going. This way of seeing things and the way of seeing things after true awakening or understanding has occurred are mutually exclusive. When awakening occurs, the whole context which contains individuals, the race, time, and value judgments is seen as an illusion, a dream. Awakening, enlightenment, means popping out of the context in which evolution makes any sense. Anything that implies a continuity, a sequence, a passing from stage to stage, cannot be the real. There is no progress in reality. It is final, perfect, unrelated. Reality is not the result of a process. It is an explosion. Nisargadatta Maharaj Someone, perhaps it was Robert Adams, once suggested that there should be a great gathering of awakened beings and anybody who showed up would be immediately disqualified. Ironically, there is such a gathering now annually. Most of the well-known teachers who have published books and tour the world giving satsang attend and give presentations. I get flyers for it in the mail. Honestly, I just received something else in the mail. A pre-publication notice for a popular spiritual teacher's new book, hawked with the tagline that at this pivotal moment in our human history, the deepest truths that were once available only to the most rare beings are now being made available to you, along with the admonition to order not one but several copies to encourage media interest. I find it startling, to put it mildly, that the spiritual seeker community apparently considers this sort of thing acceptable coming from a leading teacher and a publishing house devoted exclusively to spiritual publications. Advertisements for SUVs and Caribbean vacations use the same emotional hooks, but usually come across with a little more integrity. Transparent, deluded, manipulative, exploitative nonsense. And even perhaps on some level the idea behind it was well meant. Somebody who really believes they are an awakened being and that they are going to save the world by awakening more people than ever before. Recall Wilbur's assessment that true awakening is extremely rare anywhere in history and anywhere in the world. There is nothing amiss about trying to help people, of course, but pay attention. Telling individuals that they are so special that they have won the big prize and can now be an enlightened being, where there is still a being, a me, there to get involved in it, is ultimately not helping them or anyone else. Yes, there is suffering, but this is taking advantage of that suffering and in the end multiplying it, not ending it. This kind of stuff will always be said, will always happen, but leading spiritual teachers at least should know better. But they don't. Blind leading the blind. Nobody knows the difference. Please, dear hearts, so much suffering is perpetuated by believing this crap. Listen, there are no awakened beings, never have been. Awakening doesn't happen to people like you or to people like me because awakening doesn't happen to anyone. There is nobody home. There is no one here to awaken. Thinking that you are an awakened one or that it is possible that you might become an awakened one or that your teacher is an awakened one, or that there is at least one awakened one in a cave in the Himalaya somewhere, is called being asleep. Awakening means popping out of the context into which awakening makes any sense. Confused 
thinking. Your vision will become clear when you look into your heart. Who looks outside? Dreams. Who looks within? Awakens. Carl Jung. This blind leading the blind thing would be funny if it weren't so tragic. It would be tragic were it not so damn funny. Somebody comes along saying they have achieved full enlightenment. Comically redundant expression that. What other kind is there? Half full? Now, how the hell can 99.99999% so to speak of the population of characters wandering around here in the dream evaluate such a claim? How can they tell? But that question doesn't seem to occur to anybody. A remarkable number seem eager to believe the claim anyway. If, as the masters have asserted, only a Niani can recognize a Niani, if only when realization has occurred can there be recognition of when realization has occurred, then just about anyone can make the claim and get away with it, as long as they manage to avoid the 0.00001% who know better, which shouldn't be difficult. And once there are enough of them, all those who make the claim can authorize and certify each other. And the radical one millionth of a percent in whom there is actually the seeing of what is are marginalized as weirdos. Then you've got self-contained, self-perpetuating mainstream system going, which is utterly phony and no different than any other activity in the dream and which hardly anybody can tell is phony. The one millionth of a percent don't care. It's all a ridiculous dream. Why interfere with something that is working perfectly? Before the identified characters slogging along in the dream and caught in the suffering of trying to make some sense out of it, it's really quite tragic. Here's the funny part. Imagine a conference where the world's top experts on human sexuality are convened. One after another, these doctors and specialists in human behavior and research psychologists go to the podium to deliver scholarly lectures on the subject of orgasm. As the conference goes on, it might become obvious that none of these experts have actually experienced orgasm themselves. It's all intellectual. After long years of arduous research and many austerities, I can now tell you that I have finally achieved full orgasm. And I can confirm what all the ancient texts have said, that the very essence of orgasm consists of getting red in the face and screaming after which you become a perfect person and everybody thinks you're wonderful. Huh? But wait. Nobody in the audience has experienced orgasm either. So how would they know that the speakers are all hot air? After all, these specialists are presented as the experts, and another expert has certified their expertness, and they certainly sound impressive. So they must be right. So everybody asks questions and takes notes, and later they all signed up for the advanced seminar in which it is promised that they too for a hundred dollars and learn the disciplines necessary to get red in the face and scream, at which time they will enter the ranks of those who have been certified as having attained full orgasm and become perfect wonderful people. Of the thousands in attendance at the conference, there are just two people in the back of the hall with absolutely no scholarly qualifications at all but with a different kind of knowing, who look at each other laugh and walk out. There's a lot of confused thinking in this awakening business, and it would be helpful to make a distinction. Many spiritual seekers and many spiritual teachers talk about having had an awakening experience. They have had a profound experience of oneness, of meaning, or perhaps several such experiences, and as a result everything, including themselves, looks different and new. On the one hand, there perhaps is no better way to express this than to say that it's like waking up. There are no exclusive rights to the analogy anyway. It means what everybody does every morning when they wake up from sleep. 
So why not use the analogy to refer to a renewing experience? On the other hand, this kind of waking up has nothing whatever to do with what is being talked about here as awakening. The very fact that it is referred to as an awakening or a series of awakening experiences is a tip-off. One experience among many. The effects of such experiences may be brief or may last for a long time, sometimes for years before they fade. Then if you're lucky, there will be another one. Such experiences are profound and beautiful and bring about change and nothing is ever the same. They are very wonderful. Indeed, this is the most profound and most meaningful thing that a human being can experience. It is what is called mystical experience, and it brings with it mystical knowledge. But it is still a dream experience by dream character. What this kind of waking up is referring to is a dream character having an experience in the dream, of waking up relative to their prior level of awareness in the dream. But anything that can happen to a dream character is still in the dream, is still a dream event. It is still part of everything, the everything that is not. It is not what is being talked about here. It is not what has been talked about by the sages as awakening. This awakening talked about by the sages is not part of everything. It is the end of everything. It is not an experience and it is not knowledge. It is not an awakening. It is it. It is not relative. It is absolute. It is all that is. It is that the dream, including the dream character in which this occurs, is seen through and as such ceases to exist, is seen to have never existed. True awakening is the total annihilation of the sense of a separate self. How can it be total annihilation if it keeps happening every other weekend or every third year? Sounds like there's something left to annihilate. Once the total annihilation of any sense of being a separate self has happened, who is there to totally annihilate again? It does become obvious that what these teachers are talking about cannot be the same as what is being talked about here, as what is being talked about by the masters as ultimate, as final, as complete, gone, completed beyond. You could say that this end of everything is the end of the everything that is not. That's why when awakening occurs, it is said that nothing happens. There is no great experience in the dream. There is no great knowledge gained in the dream. There is no event at all, because all events are in the dream. Those who are selling awakening light will tell you that something wonderful happens. A true teacher will tell you that nothing at all happens. There is the stepping out of what happens, the stepping out of the idea of one to whom things happen. This is the meaning of Wayne Lickerman's comment to the effect that if you want dramatic, beautiful, profound experiences, stay in the dream. Once awakening happens, things get very ordinary. Some teachers, such as Ramesh, get away from this confusion by using the language of awakening very little, if at all, by referring to the end of everything as the understanding. Of course, that introduces its own set of potential confusions, as people think it has something to do with comprehending something, which it does not. And of course, all of this confusion is itself simply part of the perfect unfolding of totality and consciousness. Much of the misunderstanding seems to spring from an innocent underestimation. Reading the original accounts of total annihilation of self, most readers would naturally enough think that these accounts don't make much sense. After all, there's the enlightened master continuing to live and teach and certainly look like a separate self. The modern critical sense is to distrust these accounts as fanciful hagiography or devotional embellishments or as somehow allegorical 
After all, nobody knows anybody around now who appears to meet these descriptions. Hence, the underestimation. Awakening can't possibly be that rare, that strange. In short, the accounts of awakening related by the masters just don't correspond with anything that is believed to be real and true, or valuable and helpful toward making the world a better and more enlightened place. And so the accounts of what it is to realize the dream as dream are reinterpreted in the light of what we know in the dream. This kind of thinking, of course, misses the whole point of what is trying to be conveyed and is in itself just more dream. In spiritual circles, there is a great value placed on personal growth, personal improvement, becoming a better person, becoming more aware, teaching others how to become better, making the world a better and more enlightened place. The hope for a better future, the belief in an upward spiritual evolution that carries the whole race with it, is like the belief that there is something wrong and something that needs to be done. It seems hardwired into the human mechanism, but is in fact the device by which the divine hypnosis operates, keeping the dream characters motivated and occupied in the dream. This belief is an illusion, and it is what creates suffering. In truth, in the absolute, in all that is, there is no evolution, no progress, no becoming better, no becoming. All is as it is. The idea that the world is in bad shape and that the present point in history is pivotal and that something has to be done is as old as the human mind. It has always seemed thus at every point in human history. In truth, everything is in perfect balance. The world never gets better and never gets worse, although to the apparent individual instruments it may seem that it does. Teachers who draw these reoccurring themes in the dream to appeal to the ego's hopes and dreams and to popularize their message are deluding themselves and others and have not seen beyond the dream. This belief in ongoing evolution, the dream of becoming a better person, the goal of improving oneself and others in society and making the world a better place, all these and more certainly seem to be noble beliefs and goals by any standards. Our cultures value them as ideals, and it is believed that these high goals are what keep individuals and the human race from descending or regressing into chaos. And of course, it is the divine hypnosis itself that allows these beliefs, because without them, the dream would not go on. But as Buddhist teacher Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche has noted, enlightenment is the great and final disappointment, the dissolution of all our egoic fantasies and grand hopes. This is true seeing, and it will never sell in the revival tense. What is being said here is not a politically correct message, or even a spiritually correct message. It is not a comforting message and it will never in any culture be popular. It is only the truth, as near as can be told. All is as it is. The ego seeks fulfillment, and if awakening is marketed as satisfying that need, then what is being offered is bogus. The true awakening is awakening to the annihilation, the dissolution of that which seeks fulfillment. Trans Formative spirituality, authentic spirituality, is revolutionary. It does not legitimate the world. It breaks the world. It does not console the world. It shatters it. And it does not render the self content. It renders it undone. Ken Wilbur And of course, as you may perhaps intuit at this point, the wonderful aching beauty is that in this annihilation, Every longing, hunger, and thirst that any mind-body apparatus ever felt is resolved and dissolved, perfected, healed, and made forever irrelevant. The ego seeks fulfillment, but what is understood in this annihilation is so huge that no mind, 
no ego, no heart, could ever possibly hold it. The human race has no idea what fulfillment truly is. Acceptance is infinite, and it starts here in your own heart. Whatever arises is accepted.